Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is not me, as you can see. I hate Nigel Lowry because every time that I want to give a talk, I want to call it... Uh, oh, it's moving. Okay, this happened the last time. One, just give me one second. It's like automatically moving. Can you... you know what to do. So I'll keep talking. Uh, every time I want to give a talk, and I'm a, I'm a publisher, but I want to talk about why you don't need a publisher. And he gave this talk at GDC, I think, three years ago. So rather than inventing my own talks, I just steal his front cover uh, and put that instead. So I don't know if he knows this. I haven't told him. Okay, should, we... should we OK? OK. OK, so, but I did put a little bit of work this time. Uh, so it is the remix. Uh, that's me. Hello. So. Who am I? Uh, what is my purpose? Uh, actually, this is... Normally when I go to conferences and, and give talks, I know a lot of people in the audience, a lot of my friends are at the talks, a lot of game developers that I work with. And I think this is one of the only ones where I know very few people, which is both terrifying and really exciting. So, hello, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I am Callum Underwood. I work at Raw Fury. Something I realized this trip is that a lot of people in uh, the Kiev and, and Ukrainian games industry don't know who Raw Fury is. So I have a video up next to kind of show you the kind of things we do. But to summarize, we are a indie games publisher. We focus on premium games, so we don't do uh, free to play. We may do in-app transactions and things like that, but we don't focus on free to play. We focus on games that have an upfront cost, and we like games that are cross-platform. So we like games that exist on PC, console, and we also put some things on mobile as well. So at every publisher, or most publishers at least, there's someone with my role, or someone who does the role that I do. And it's, it's called a scout. So for these, those of you who know already, I'm, you know, this is nothing new, but what I do is I travel the world, and, and well, mostly travel Twitter, trying to find games that we might want to publish. So it's my job not only to, you know, say no to a lot of people, because a lot of people pitch me their games, but it's also my job to understand in one, two, three years what is going to be successful, what sort of the trends are going to be made. Actually, you could say that it's up to the publishers what, tr what the trends are going to be based on the types of games that we sign. So my job is, is a lot of guesswork, a tiny bit of strategy, uh, and a lot of just playing lots and lots of games and trying to make educated guesses as to uh, what is going to be a success or not. So I have a video here. Let me see if I can play it. This is a quick... Here we go. So these are all our announced games and released games. Uh, it's not actually in 8 FPS when I put it on here, so just imagine it's running much faster. Dandara is actually launching in, in just a few days. I might turn the audio off because it's running really slowly. Uh... Okay, there we go. I'll just talk over it. Oh, did I pause the whole thing? I'm terrible at this. Okay, so this is uh, Kingdom. Uh, this is Kathy Rain, this is a point-and-click adventure. You've seen a roguelike, you've seen Kingdom. Uh, we, we don't really focus on any specific genre. We like lots of different things. This is Tormenta that you're about to see in just a moment. The audio and video is completely messed up, so I do apologize about that. Uh, so this is a, an arena fighter. And you might be able to notice some uh, kind of correlation between all these games. Usually they are between one and ten people working on the team. Uh, it's common to have kind of pixelated art style games that we publish. Um, and all of these, or at least most of these, exist on Switch, PS4, Xbox, uh, PC, and some on mobile as well. Uh, I think it just stopped, so never mind. Uh, let me see if I can just... The last one is the one that I think we're most well-known for. Uh, no. Okay, we also did the last night. Uh, we announced the last night at E3. Uh, I would, if you want to view it on my phone afterwards, just let me know. I can't really put it on screen. Uh, I'm sorry for that. So, what am I going to talk about today? Uh, 
I say no to between five and 20 games a week, generally. And what I want to talk about today is why a publisher might say no to your game and what you can control about that process to help yourself to get a yes from a publisher. And obviously, a yes from a publisher means funding, marketing, you know, promotion, all of these other things. But we say no to the vast majority of things. And you can't control a lot of that. You, know, you can make your game, you can approach the right publishers, but you can't control a lot of it when it's in their hands. So that's what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to take questions at the end, and I'm happy to talk until someone throws me off stage. So if you have any questions you've ever wanted to ask a publisher but felt that it's not polite or you're afraid of asking it, just please ask me. Uh, if it's like very specific numbers that I can't talk about, such as you know, PS4 sales figures, I, I can't answer you. But otherwise, please think of any questions that you'd like to ask. Or if you hate publishers, you can tell me that as well, and we can talk about that. So like I said, most of the process you cannot control. Here's what you can control. You could view this as how to improve your chances of, of getting a publisher to agree to sign your game. So your game build, and I, I actually think this is the, the hardest part of the whole process. So we as a publisher like to look at games in the prototype stage. So we fully fund development. So we would prefer to see a game between two and six months into development. Maybe there's a vertical slice, maybe it's a prototype, maybe it's just an art test. That's when we like to look at games, because then if we can sign it at that point, we can skip potentially six months of the developer having to kind of keep pitching to other publishers and developing, and we can just get on with making the game. But also, we, we can provide more value to the game at that point if we're able to work with the game for two years, you know, and start talking to press, start figuring out how to build a community. Rather than coming in three, two months before launch, which often happens, people come to us, they're like, hey, we're in early access, uh, can you help us launch the game? It's too late at that point for us. There are publishers who do that and who specialize in last-minute marketing and call up their press contacts and things like that. But we feel we provide the most value from being there for the whole process. The problem with this is, is this sentence. How do you get someone, me, to understand what years of work, two, three years, however long it takes to finish your game, might look like in a matter of minutes? And what I mean by a matter of minutes is it can take me less than 15 seconds to say no to your game. I play every game that gets sent to me, everything. If it runs, that is. And, and they don't always run. Uh, or they're a Mac build or, or, or something. Uh, so I play everything. And if, if I'm, it can take 10 seconds, 15 seconds. You know, you launch a game, you start to play. It's, maybe it's free to play. Maybe it's just a mobile game. Maybe it's just really awful, or whatever. I'll go into this in a minute. And so I'm just like, OK, no, pass. What's next? And this is really hard for a developer, because you're trying to explain to me as a publisher what it'll look like in two years, right? What the community would be like. If it's a multiplayer game, like, how big is it going to get? What is it going to feel like? What are the mechanics? You know, what are the levels? And you can't really do that in a very small portion of a game. So I think like this is the most important thing. And, and what you need to do here is, is find some magic in your build. And this is where it, 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 we move away from data and everything, and we just come to a, a nebulous, you know, yay, it has to be magic. Um, but it's true. There has to be something about that prototype or that game build that captures your own attention as a developer. And I'll show you some examples in a little bit, but uh, if we talk about Cuphead, right? So Cuphead looks amazing. It has this old, you know, 30s style. It's a good game. Would that game have captured the attention of the press and the consumer if it looked like a normal indie game? I don't think so, personally, right? So what that game has done is, by having something magic and something special about it, it turns heads towards it. It then backs it up by being a good game. Um, but if it hadn't looked like that, it would have had a bigger mountain to climb. So when I talk about magic, I'm talking about maybe the audio is just incredible. Maybe I have an emotional connection to one of the characters. Maybe it just looks different to anything I've played. Or maybe it looks like garbage, but when I play it, it's just I, I want to keep playing it. So there has to be something about it. And if you do play tests, if you show publishers, if you play it yourself, and there's not something 
magical about it. It's a, it's a 7 out of 10 game on all categories. That's okay, but that's not what publishers are looking for. Publishers are looking for something that has that little gem that we can grow into to the whole game being magical. So the pitch. Uh, I, I very rarely make a lot of sense, by the way. So it, your, your pitch doesn't matter, but it kind of also matters at the same time. Uh, and what I mean here is, this is a pitch of a game that I signed late last year. And I know the text is small, so I'll read it out. Would you be interested in publishing Atomic Crops, an action-packed roguelike farming simulator? Right? So even with that line, I was immediately sold. The actual subject line of the, of the submission uh, was, Stardew Valley meets Nuclear Throne. Uh, and I was like, okay, brilliant, I get it. I like farming, I like Twin Stick, I'm interested. Straight away, there's a, there's a website. So I can just click on the website, take a look. There's also a build, okay? This to me is a pitch. When you talk to people about what a pitch is, you normally expect it to be documents with information about the team, information about the game, what people have worked on in the past what your monetization strategy is, that's fine. And that, that suits some publishers. For publishers like us, this is a pitch, because a pitch to me is showing me your game and allowing me to understand what it is in a very, in a very quick way. So this is a really bad pitch, but look how simple this is. This didn't require a meeting. This didn't require anything other than knowing my email address. And that is, I had this conversation with some friends at lunch. It's true that it can be difficult, especially for people who aren't in my country or friends with me already, to find people like me. Uh, but I think it's getting easier nowadays. We have very open email addresses. Our website has a submission form. And this is what he did. He just came in, didn't know who he was, didn't know who we worked for. Simple pitch. So the game looked like garbage. It didn't look good. And maybe I'll show you and you'll disagree with me. But it didn't, it didn't look special, right? It looked like just a, a normal game, it looked okay. Danny is the developer, I did ask him his permission to say this. He didn't reply, so I took that as a yes. Uh, it, it had something special, so it had this magic. And what the magic was, it didn't look good, but I, I, I understood what he wanted to do. So I played the game. Like an hour later, I was still playing the game. This almost never happens. So I sent a bill to other people in the office, Two hours later, we had about nine people in the office all playing the game and talking about it. And as soon as you get something like that, even in your own office as a developer, you know that there's something special about what you're building. So this is what it used to look like. Uh, and I think these are, I should be able to play these, maybe. Is that playing? Yeah. So it's, it's okay. It has some farming stuff. Uh, you can see kind of how you might control it uh, with a mouse. Um, but it doesn't look, I mean, look at the, the, the character is just awful. Like, he doesn't even have a, the front of his face. It's just a, a blob. Um, so I wasn't excited, but it, it, it worked well, it ran. And this is what it looks like now. So it's, it's, again, this is running quite slowly. But the artist for Nidhogg 2 came on board, Toby Dixon, and just basically redid the whole art, and they thought about what style the game might be. So this is an example of a game that starts with something special, and the special thing in this case was gameplay. Then they build everything else up around that. And the way that that happened was, and I'll talk about what our process looks like, but the way that that happened is we played the game, we really enjoyed it, so I called him up and I was like, this is amazing, like, what's your plan? He's like, I don't have a plan, I just I, I thought I'd send you my build. And that's okay for us, because we're a publisher, we know other people who work on games. It's, 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 we know business. There's a lot of things we don't know, and developers know better than us, of course, but you know, we know who to put him in touch with. I said, who's your dream artist? He said, well, I really like Toby Dixon. So I called Toby up. I was like, hey, what are you doing? Are you busy? Do you fancy you know, making this cool, psychedelic Western game? He was like, sure. So you don't always have to have all of the pieces to capture a publisher's attention. So we'll move on to budget. A budget is the other thing that you can control. So these are fake numbers, um, but this is, what I, this is what I and Raw Fury count as a budget. And this is, this is very light, and this is due to the way that we work as a company. So we do not have milestones, and specifically we do not have milestones that are tied to finances. So often you'll have an alpha milestone that is tied to 30,000. You may get 30,000 at contract signature and another 100,000 when the game ships. 
That isn't really how indie development works. You have a team of two or three people. You may have a production schedule and you may have internal milestones, but why would we tie those to money? Because if you slip, this is just game development. This is what happens. So all I care about at this point, when is the game going to launch? Who is going to be working on the game? Not the people themselves, but how much do they cost? What is their salary? Um, where are we going to ship it? And the, the reason I have platforms in there is because it gives us an idea of uh, porting costs or you know, certification, how long that might take, how many months, and what is the development budget? Our development budget that, when I ask a developer what their budget is, I'm asking what is your burn rate between now and when the game ships? Then we add three or four months on top of that, and that's, we just pay it each month, almost like a salary. So this is something you can be smart about. You can have an idea of who you want to work with, how long you think the game is going to take, but also this will change and we understand that. So your team. Again, your team is something that you can control very well. So due diligence, for, for those who don't know, due diligence is, is where you dig deeper into the idea of something and, and just kind of explore around it, see if it makes sense. Usually it's, does this make business sense? You know, are there other games in the market? How much have they made? Is there an opportunity? Is there an existing community around this? But for me and for us, due diligence is also about working with you, the people. You know, do we actually like each other? We don't have to love each other, but can we, can we work together for two years, for three years? You know, what do you like outside of our meetings? What do you like when you're talking on Twitter? What do you like when you, you know, meeting other developers? You know, are you someone that I'm, I'm happy to associate my brand with? This is from my Twitter. I'm awful at Twitter. This, this is me enjoying curry. Uh, this is 11 a.m. This isn't even, I'm not drunk. I just like curry at 11 a.m. in the morning. So it's not always the best example. But what I'm trying to say here is, Work with people that you want to work with, and also work with the publisher that you want to work with. If you have multiple publishers looking at your game, and you really feel a connection with some of them, but not others, go with the people that you feel a connection with. So your publisher strategy. This is, this is I think, the final thing that you can control, really. Every publisher looks at many games, and I'll come to this. You need to focus on those that you think would like your game, okay? So let's say you, you have a game that you think is suitable for Raw Fury, Devolver and Tiny Build, okay? What I think is the bad thing to do is to send it to all of these publishers at the same time. Because what might happen, and actually what often happens, is we might be like, fuck yeah, this game is great. I want to make you an offer. You know, here's our contract. Let me know when you can talk more. But Tiny Build might not have replied yet, and you actually might prefer Tiny Build. You know them already, you know, you know other developers have been published by them. So you find yourself in this awkward situation where we're trying to make a deal with you from Raw Fury, and you're like now chasing Tiny Build, and do you say yes to us and regret it because you didn't go with the publisher you wanted, or do you say no to us and then Tiny Build says no? So this is more about psychology. If you want Tiny Build to publish your game, approach them first, right? When you get a no or when it doesn't look good, then you start to approach other people. If you contact 50 publishers at once, you're going to get into really hard situations where you have to make decisions that are time-based that might not necessarily have had to be time-based before that. So just be careful as, as to how many you contact and who you contact at the time. So you, that's, that's what you can control. And I, I've probably missed things, but Pretty much everything else is just out of your control within this pitching process, okay? So, we don't have infinite resources at Raw Fury. And actually, no publisher has infinite resources. And resources doesn't just mean money, by the way. Resources means time, people, attention, etc. So, we only want to sign X games for a year. Every publisher is around the same. They probably have an idea of how many games they can comfortably handle. For us, this is about four to six. To be clear, we're only three years old as a publisher, so this may change, right? We've just, you know, we've shipped, I think, around five or six games now that started, you know, one or two years ago. But the amount that I'm looking for is between four and six a year, and this isn't many games at all, okay? And it's about care and attention of those games and of those developers. It's not about the funds. We can find money, right? It's a Swedish company, investment is crazy in Sweden. It's very easy to find money for things. It's not about lack of money for us. I mean, you know, sometimes it is, but. So what does this mean exactly? So PAX booth, we have a PAX booth. You can't put 20 games on a PAX booth. You can, but you're gonna really dilute how good your booth has been at that point, okay? 
So if we only have room for three games, but we've signed 15 games that year, what are we going to focus on? This is okay, I think, if you're a mobile publisher and you can have a stack of 10 iPhones and your strategy is to, you know, flood the market with good mobile games. But for us as, as PC games, you know, we need a monitor for each game, we need a setup. We can only pick three or four. Well, what do we tell the other 10 devs we've signed if we, if we can't choose them for packs? Same, Xbox offers an E3 announcement. We announced the last night at E3 last year, the game you see here. If you have 10 games and you can only really give one, you still have a problem. If we have five games we've signed and we can only choose one, but often when you have a smaller amount of games, the decision is almost made by the game itself. Is it ready? Can they do a trailer in time? If you have a lot of games because you've just gone out and spent money on everything that you've seen, you have to make these hard decisions. Certification takes a lot of time and effort. If you have even us, we ship between four and six games a year on three to four platforms each. That's a lot of SKUs to, to track, to pay for, to handle. Nintendo sends it back, but Xbox is okay. You know, anyone who's been through CERT knows what I'm talking about. Times that by four, you'll know how difficult it is. Times that by 15 with all platforms, and you know now why we're not too interested in having many, many games. It's about only holding so many hands. It's about only working with so many people that we can give each developer the attention. Uh, I think this is funny. You probably won't. But I googled clone producers. I was like, oh, I'll find a funny image to put here. And of course, George Lucas, you know, produced the clones movie. I don't know Star Wars, but hey. So uh, I added emojis to this because I, I thought it was a really dull slide. So I hope I hope that helps. Uh, this is, these charts are how many games Raw Fury uh, looked at in the last three years. So 2015 and 2016, you can see on the left over here, pretty much the same, maybe an extra 20%. 2017, we looked at eight times the amount of games last year than we did the year before. But you look at the games signed on the side, Again, they're basically the same. We actually went down in 2016, although we looked at more games. 2017 was only a little bit more than 2016. So, and 2015. So the amount of competition, not, I'm not talking about selling your game. I'm not talking about how many games there are on Steam. I'm talking about the mental fact that publishers have to look at each game and decide what they want to publish. And it's just, there's, there's a lot to look at here. So you have to kind of get through this. You can't control this. You can, if you contacted Raw Fury in 2015, you probably had a better chance of getting published by us, right? We're a new publisher, no one really knew who we were. Now, you know, we're on the pitch circuit with, with all the others and it's, it's becoming a lot more difficult for developers. So there's more competition, but also what this chart shows is that we're not, we are limited by resources. We're not limited by the games that we see. You know, we're not, I mean, we do struggle to find good games, but we still have a cap. We still only really want to sign about the same each year. Signing more games means hiring more people and growing the company more than we want to do right now. Um, and yeah, I took a screenshot of my Excel and, and kind of fucked it up, so. Okay, it can take less than a minute for me to decide. This is sometimes really awkward, especially if someone sends me a Steam key. Uh, so I load up the Steam key, I play the game, maybe they have some tracking in there. I send them an email, I was like, hey, that was cool, but no, I'm okay, it's not for us. They're like, you played it for 45 seconds, I can see from our back end. I'm like, fuck, yeah, I did. Um, but the reason that is, is because you just know. Sometimes you don't know, but your goal as a developer to a publisher is to, to in that first 45 seconds, one minute, two minutes, is to have them keep playing. Um, why do I say no to things that are less than a minute? Maybe it just looks and feels terrible. Maybe it is a, uh, a really amazing tennis simulator. We don't really want to publish simulators. We don't understand simulators. Maybe it's a, a game that revolves around loot boxes and monetization. That's not a comment about whether those are good or bad. That's a comment about us as a publisher. We don't know how to sell games like that. We know premium. It might be a VR game. You know, I don't want to publish a VR game right now. I would look at them and if there's the right thing, I don't know what the right thing is, I would. But if it's not the right thing, it just, you can decide extremely quickly. That's really horrifying as a developer. You spent all this time, you've arranged a meeting, you've packaged up a build, you've sent a pitch document to a publisher and they just say no almost immediately. It can be really heartbreaking. So 
Why do we say no? We say no for many, many more reasons than you would think. And actually, most of them have nothing to do with the specific quality of that game that I've just played. Again, we're looking at prototypes. Quality is, is kind of subjective. So, genre. We have published a point-and-click adventure in the past. We have another one in the pipeline. I don't really want another point-and-click adventure at this point. I want to find something different. We don't have a genre strategy, but maybe it's just a genre that we don't feel we're very good at. If it's a grand strategy game, right? R big, deep, grand strategy game. That's not, that's not what we do. That's Paradox. Paradox should publish this, right? So maybe the genre is not correct. We already have a similar game. I've already ripped off Rami's idea of having a nuclear throne, right, with atomic crops. What if someone else pitches us a very similar game? Do we really want to have two competing games in our lineup? Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you get known for having a style of games that you ship, and you can continue building that community. But for us, we don't really want to have our devs competing with each other as such, especially not in the same genre and for, you know, mind space. It doesn't feel right. That means nothing. That just means I am like, eh. Uh, no, it's not for us. And it's very hard to give feedback on that because it, there's nothing I disliked about the game. It just doesn't feel correct for Raw Fury. This is the same as doesn't immediately cause a reaction. What you're looking for when you're pitching a publisher and they're playing your game is you're looking for them to either just keep playing and not saying anything, or you're looking for them to be like, oh, yeah. Oh. You know, these noises are what you want because that's where a publisher like me starts to get interested in the game. And here's where it gets a bit, a bit odd. Maybe I'm just not in the mood, right? Maybe I've had a bad day. You only have one chance to talk to a publisher. Maybe I'm hungry, right? Or hangry. Hungry, angry. And maybe when I try your game, I'm just not in the mood for it. Like, this is the fact of human life. I would love to say that I look at every game with, with incredible analytical skill and data and really figure out where it's going to fit. But sometimes you just, you might catch me in the wrong mood. You might catch anybody in the wrong mood. We've all had meetings with people where you can just tell that they're not in the right mood for the meeting, right? And this is the same with, with pitching games. So it continues. Maybe we've already signed six, seven games this year, and it's just the wrong time for us to look at your game. It's kind of weird because even if publishers, and this is, this is kind of bad, but even if publishers know that 99% of the time they're not going to sign a new game. They still want to look at the games because who knows, maybe they find that something special where they decide, actually, fuck it, we're going to sign an eighth game this year. And you don't know what a publisher is like. It's like buying a car, a used car. If you buy it at the beginning of the month, maybe you pay more. If you buy it at the end of the month, maybe it's less. It's about human nature and it's about finding the publisher at the right time. And what my point is, is you cannot control this. This is just life and it kind of sucks, but this is just how it works. To be clear, this is also the same the other way around. I've lost out on games because I've contacted them three days too late. No, we've already signed with Humble, but actually we would have loved to work with you, Raw Fury, but we've already signed. It happens the other way around. You just, you can't control it and you have to feel okay with it. Maybe we did run out of money. This hasn't happened yet, but it, it could easily happen, right? Especially with cash flow. A no is often a one-person's decision. That's my decision. The first decision at Raw Fury when we look at games is I'm either yes or no. If it's a no, it just gets, it gets put back and I can send you some feedback. It's a, if it's a yes, that's not a yes, we are going to now send you a contract. That's a yes, I'm going to show this to the rest of my team. So I kind of lied at the start when I said you don't need a publisher. Uh, and I felt like I needed a slide that actually, that actually did it. So, we aren't the magic ticket to getting games sold, right? If you go and look on Steam Spy, some of our games have nearly a million. Some of our games have 10, 15,000, right? This is just a fact of life. The, the way that a publisher survives, and I believe a lot of the reason for a publisher, especially a publisher like us who funds development, so, for example, if we, if we decide to sign your game, we will pay your salaries for two years, okay? The reason publishers can survive is because we make lots of bets. Some of those bets will sell a million copies. Some of them will sell 5,000 copies. Obviously, the 5,000 copy is not good for the de developer or us. Actually, we're okay. We already sold a million copies of this other game, so we can continue doing it. Um, the important part to look at is what happens when a game does fail. What happens to the relationship with the publisher and the developer? Kathy Rain was one of our first games, and it was made by one guy. 
he, uh, the game took a long time to break even, I think around a year. So what we did is we said to the developer, we're like, okay, we'll just pay your salary for another year. This was $20,000, $30,000 or so. Because we thought, we've signed you up, we've believed in you, we've both taken risk, let's just keep paying you so you can, you can survive. And this is how I build all my contracts now, is we have the launch date, which is where you know, normally you'd have the cutoff of us paying salary. Now we add two, three, four months to that, because if the game is taking time to make its money back, the, the developer has some leeway before they can you know, do something else. So, but it's clear to notice that not every game that we publish is a success. And also, not all of these games are going to get signed. The orange line, remember, is the amount of games that we viewed last year. This is in the high hundreds. Uh, and not all of those will get signed. Actually, very few of those will get signed. So I want to take a quick segue to something I found funny. When I was looking at the data for what was getting submitted to Raw Fury over the past few years, I realized that I could stack it by the words that were in the game title. Okay? So we're looking at hundreds of games that were submitted in 2017, and this is a little word cloud. You can, you can talk about this word cloud however you like. Something I found quite interesting is how you know, bad or violent the words tend to be. You know, dead is one of the top, battle is one of the top. You know, things like devil, fall, sword, dungeon, heroes, these are all like, you know, fighting words. Only we, you know, we have maybe friends, we have light, and there's some others, but honestly, looking at the, the vast majority, a lot of them were very gamey. And I'm not really trying to make a point there, it's just I'd love to see a word cloud like this in 2018, where it's just all really nice stuff, you know, kittens and hello and friendly. So, I put this on Twitter, and because Twitter is insane, someone wrote a tracery program to uh, automatically create game names to submit to Raw Fury, uh, which I, I thought was genius. Um, the, the key mistake that they made was we've yet to sign a game with any of those words in. So it's how to pitch a game to Raw Fury and automatically fail, I guess. If you, you can download this yourself. So, how do we choose games? I promised to kind of open the curtain on a publisher and how we work. How specifically does Raw Fury choose games? Other publishers have their own processes, but I think this is similar to certainly some of them. I know the Good Shepherd do this very similarly to we do. Uh, Team 17 are also the same. So first, the only thing I care about at the beginning is I want to play the game and I want to know what your development budget is. I do not care who you are. I don't care what you've made in the past. I don't care where you live. You could be a student living in a basement five miles from my house, or you could be a successful, famous San Francisco indie darling developer. At this point, it just does not matter, because what I'm looking for is the magic in the build. It's a slight lie, because it kind of also does matter. It is easier. I'm not trying to make out like it is just as easy for a student as it is for a successful developer to get a publishing deal. But what I'm saying is when I'm looking at the build, it just doesn't matter. If the build is okay, then I start to talk to the developer more. Um, this is where we find out who they are and decide these things. So let's say it's a yes at the first point. I play the game, the budget works for us, and in the spirit of being open, our budgets for development range between 50 and $400,000, something like that. This is for burn rate. This is to pay the people making the game. We also have what we call a service charge. Uh, uh, service budget, sorry. This is QA, marketing, porting, advertising. Anything that we actually spend hard cash on is added into a separate pot. And this way we can ensure that our development budgets all tend to mean we work between one and ten people on the game, and we tend to match it on the, the other side of things, on actual spend. So you could say we look at between $100,000 and $800,000 for the complete budget of the game to get it out on all the platforms, but in terms of paying you, the developer, who will likely maybe just make a PC game, this is, this is the budget that I care about at this point. So if I say yes, we go to wider play sessions. I have the whole, you know, two other people in the company. They'll, they'll go and play the game they'll let me know what they think. Everyone gets a veto at Raw Fury. Everyone is allowed to say, I will not allow you to sign this game. This has only happened once, and, and actually I, I, I kind of ignored it, which removes the whole point of having a veto. 
Uh, but I persuaded him that it was going to be okay, and we should sign it, and he, he relented. So maybe that wasn't quite fair. But we've, we've, at this point in the wider play sessions, where three or four of us might play, a lot of the time, it's because I'm like, this is cool, what do you think? A lot of the time, one of them will say no, and we just move on, we pass it. Because at this point, unless everyone is like, fuck, yeah, this game is going to be awesome, we don't carry on. So then we look at the team, then we look at the scope. How big is the game going to be? When are you going to launch? Is there a community already? Who is going to buy the game? And I have pitch here. What I mean by pitch is like, what is everything around the game? You know, who's going to, who do you want to work with? You know, do we think this will work on consoles? Do we think it's going to work everywhere else? We do what a lot of publishers do at the first point, where you go in and do a pitch, but we do it collaboratively with the developer. So I showed you an example earlier on, Atomic Crops, the, uh, the twin stick farming game. He had no idea who he wanted to work with. So we just sat down, we figured out what his budget might be, we called up some friends, we called up an audio guy, Martin Farley, we called up, uh, uh, actually Eunice Turner was doing the sound, we called up Toby Dixon, and we, we helped him get to this point. And the reason we do it this way is because we can help on this sort of thing. And if we've decided that what you have is special from one person or two people, we want to help you turn it into something else. We're not, it's selfish for us to expect developers to come to us with a completed idea and a completed project. I have no idea how long I have left, by the way, so I'm just going to keep talking. I have like four hours more of slides. So then the whole team plays, the whole company. 14 people at Raw Fury now. Everyone plays the game. Everyone gives feedback. This is where it gets a little messy, because it's a democratic process, but we're not a democracy. If, if every game you signed relied on everyone democratically choosing what they thought was good, what they didn't think was good. You would never sign any games. I'm sure you've been in, in meetings and things where this happens. So this is more like we take feedback from anyone. Again, people can have a veto at this point. People can say, I do not want to work on this game. Then we don't work on the game. Then we do due diligence and face-to-face. -face. We fly every developer that we sign out to Stockholm, where the HQ is, and spend a couple of days with the developer. This isn't really to discuss work. This is to drink, to eat, to spend time with each other, to go bowling. This is to have both parties understand, do we want to spend the next two years of my life speaking to these people on a daily or weekly basis? And this is on both sides, right? The developer might decide, fuck, these guys are they're assholes, right? I don't want to work at these. And we might decide, the, the same, right? That hasn't happened yet. Usually at this point we're quite clear, but it gives a chance for everyone to just really understand who they're going to work with. Then we do contract and, and cuddles. The contract is actually one of the easiest parts, which might sound strange, but all of our contracts are exactly the same. The only things that change in the contracts are the burn rate of the developer, you know, how much is the game going to cost, and how much we're going to put in on the service side. How much do we want to spend on marketing? Everything else is, is the same. We might change little words here and there to suit the developer, um, but all of our key things don't change. For example, uh, our revenue share is the same for every single developer. This means when we have a lot of developers, I think we have nine or ten now, in our Slack group who all talk to each other, they can ask each other what their contracts are and, hey, they're all the same, right? You don't get that awkward situation where some people have a better deal than others. We just present what we think is a good deal. And we will change it if we think it's not fair, but generally they're all exactly the same. Uh, we don't take IP. So none of our developers you know, have the fear that we're going to take their IP, but not other people, and so on and so forth. So I stole this off the internet, as I do most things. Um, don't sign with the person in the middle if you're creating the type of games that Raw Fury publish. If you're creating a game that heavily relies on monetization, you probably want someone who has a very clear idea of what that is in the world, okay? And understands the business and has relationships on, in all different countries, can get you loaded onto mobile phones in, in different areas of the world. For us, this isn't us. If you find someone trying to find a cool indie premium game and they, you know, they're, they, they don't understand gameplay or indies, that's, that's not who you should go with. Same here. We want the untamed creative genius. We want the weirdos. We want the people who just want to sit down and make a game. And it's for us to help them do everything else, right? Reliable workers would be great. That's kind of a byproduct sometimes of working with the developer itself. 
Okay. Very lastly, on raw fury, um, people often ask us, what are you looking for in games? What is your type? What is your class of games? And the example a lot of people use is Devolver. You know, if you think of a Devolver game, they often, you know it's a Devolver game. They're very, very, very good at signing games that both do well and also match their house class, I guess you could say. So we don't, we're kind of too new to really have found our style, but something we're definitely looking for and something that really turns my head is something that is either visually striking or iconic. And just for an example here, Nightcall in the top middle, this is like a, an Uber, as in the car driving service. It looks like an Uber map, but it's a murder mystery at the same time. Top right, Whispers of a Machine is a point and click adventure. Top left, Bad North, is a real time strategy minimalist game. Bottom right is a 3D shader driven adventure game. So we don't have a specific genre, but what we do do is look at things that just turn heads and look a little different and have their own style, they have their own aesthetic. So finally, something I think a lot of people forget is you can ask people like me and other publishers for advice. So I did the, there was a speed dating thing today where I met, I think, 15 developers for three minutes each and they would pitch me their game. And it was funny because I realized that I think 13 out of 15 had free-to-play mobile games. So I sit down and they're like, hey, here's my game. And I'm like, I'm not going to publish your game. Why don't we talk instead about if you have any advice, if you'd like me to play it and give you feedback or anything like that. Remember that we are all human and we're all in the games industry. We're here for a reason. You can ask people like me questions. You can ask me for advice. You can tweet people on the internet. We're a lot nicer than you might, you might think. If you get a no from a publisher or an investor, Asking for some more info on why that is, 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 is always okay. You may not get an answer, don't worry about that. But you can ask. If I say no to a game without feedback, and then they ask me, hey, can you just tell me what you thought of the game? That allows me to then give them my feedback. I don't give unsolicited feedback because sometimes the developer doesn't want the feedback. But you can ask. If you get a no, ask why. Maybe you'll understand more in the future. And it's okay to get a no. In fact, as you saw from my chart, most people get a no, and you will get told no from multiple people, almost always. You just should have a plan for what you do when you get a no. So that's my talk. I hope that made some sense. Um, I'm open to answering any questions or comments you might have. Here are my many, many email addresses. That's me on Twitter. You probably don't want to follow me. I'm not very interesting. Uh, but thank you so much, and I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, uh, if, before we start with the question from the audience, I have one question. Uh, you uh, repeated several times that uh, you are always busy, so you have uh, 14 people and you don't take more than six games in a, in a year. Right. Uh, what do you think? What, what you need to change to make it number doubles? Or what kind of uh, specific people are you looking for right now? In when, your team. When you say people, are you talking about who are we trying to hire for the company? Yeah, yeah. We're not trying to hire right now, um, to, to be blunt about it. The, the style of publishing that we do focuses on nearly everyone in the company works on the game somewhat, okay? And the reason that is, is we're signing games that might take one, two, or three years to, to ship, okay? That's a long time. It would be different if we were a publisher that focused on games that were three months from launch, we could ship 20 games a year. It, it's a different style of working. But actually most of our team are producers. Then we have marketing, we have a PR guy, we have a, a, you know, all of these other people, but most of them are producers helping the developer produce their game and helping them keep on track. We don't force that at all, but we provide that help. So we could double our company by just going to hire people. This isn't a difficult thing when you're in, in Sweden. There are other people who can help you do what you do. But it's about scale and it's about being able to focus on specific games. We may add one or two people over time. We recently added someone who focuses specifically on finance, right? They added me eight months ago. Before that, the CEO and everyone else just looked at games. So we have been hiring for specific things. Um, but we, we don't want to be shipping 10, 15, 20 games a year because we can't show each game the love and care and attention that we want to do. Raw Fury is made up of, of mostly industry executives. So the CEO of DICE, 
who made Battlefield. He joined us a few months ago. Uh, other people were VPs at Paradox. Other people, one of the founders of Destructoid. So they're all kind of people who've been in the industry a while who specifically want to work in a small company working on games that they love. And that's, that's, that's raw fury in a nutshell. We don't want to double the amount of people that we have. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, hi, Callum. Uh, name is Max. Uh, hi, Max. And I'll be a little bit impotent. Uh, I have three questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, the first one. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, if you're telling uh, no to a developer, uh, are you giving a feedback uh, some of some kind? It may be short, but still. I try and add one line of feedback to every no that I give. And sometimes that feedback is, I don't have any feedback for you. It's just a no. Right? Because sometimes you just don't know. The game could be fine. It's just like, eh, this isn't for us. It doesn't have that piece. So sometimes I say that. Sometimes they ask for more feedback. At that point, I can think about, okay, what did I play? How long did I play it? And if I have time, I'll send more feedback. But I always like to send one line. Um, sometimes it's, you know, I don't know. Sometimes it's just, this is the wrong genre for us. Sometimes it's, I found this really, really difficult. But you have to understand, if I say no because a game is too difficult, the developer goes, okay, great, I'll just make it easier and then I'll, I'll pitch again, send a new build. So I don't, really, I don't say no because a game is too difficult. I say no because it's not a game that we want to publish. So it, it, it's, it's, it's important to, to know, are you asking for feedback on why I said no, or you're asking for feedback on the build itself? Because often they're completely different things and they're, they're unseparated. So I always give like one little line, but I usually wait for the developer to ask if, if they want more. Yeah, okay. Uh, the second one uh, is, um, what if uh, uh, the developer will resubmit you uh, the, the build uh, after some time when uh, he uh, fine. Uh, changed totally fine. something? Yeah, uh, it's fine. The question was, if I say no, can you then resubmit a build in two, three, four months? Of course. No, no one is going to say no to that, as long as it's different. If it's the same build, it's still a no. But as long as it's there's something different, I'm going to play it because, again, as you've seen, it can take me a minute to decide no again. Okay? So that's fine. I, I will always try games again. Yeah. Great. Uh, and the, uh, the last question. Um, versus the situation when uh, you themselves, uh, as a publisher, are going to developer and you discover a really great game that you really want to publish. Yes. When, when or does that happen? Uh, does that happen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But actually, I would say 50% of the reason that I was hired is because I want to go out and find things that aren't being shown yet. So a lot of people pitch me, and that's fine. As you've seen, we've, hired, we've signed games that people pitch. But some of the rest of the time, so this, this let me skip back. So this game on the bottom right, they were like four months from having something that they would even want to show someone. And I just bullied them into showing me something, okay? I met, I met them in London, I sat down, and I played what they had. And it was, it was pretty bad. But what it was is it had something about it and I believed in their vision. So a lot of my job involves looking at Screenshot Saturday, the hashtag on Twitter. Um, it's interesting, actually. I've been talking to a lot of people today and everyone uses Facebook. It doesn't seem like a lot of people use Twitter, which was really interesting. For me, most of the games industry is on Twitter. So that's something I've learned. But that, I look at GIFs on Twitter. GIFs on Twitter will get you so very far. It's unbelievable. I, I know so many games that have been signed off the back of a two, three second GIF because it, it forces you to look at it. So yeah, a lot of my job, and actually where the competition comes in between us, Tiny Build, Devolver, Chucklefish, so on and so forth, comes from the ability to go out and find these things and explain why they you know, might need a publisher or encourage them to talk to you. So yeah, absolutely. To answer your question. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. No problem. You change your mind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, tell me, please, um, with how many devs you've been working with, uh, you've published the second game? Uh, so far, one. And why uh, with someone you did and with someone you didn't? Publish the second game and third, maybe four. No, that, that, that's a good question. I'm just I'm trying to think exactly how to answer that. So we have we're working on the the follow up to one game, Whispers of a Machine. It's not a sequel, but it's by the same developer. 
He, he sold Kathy Rain. It took a while to break even. But what it did was it got this really good community around it from uh, you know, adventure game fans. And he said, OK, I want to make another game. I like working with you, Raw Fury. Do you want to publish this? For us, this was before I joined, but for us, as I understand it, it was an easy decision. The game made money. We like the developer. We like their idea for a second game. So we've gone and done it. We're talking to a couple of our other developers about their sequels. Um, if, a, if a developer that we already work with and trust and have a relationship with pitches as a second game, and it passes that first test of like, is there something special here? We're going to sign it, of course. Like, it's an, it's an easy decision to make. Uh, there are probably, we haven't, we haven't published that many games, like I said, five or six, but there may be one that just doesn't want to work with us again. You know, his game didn't do that well. Maybe he's decided not to make games anymore. Maybe he wants to go and make them with someone else. Um, and that's fine, but remember, when you publish a game, that developer doesn't just disappear, you know? We're still working with original developers who were with us three years ago, you know, the Kingdom developers, on updates of the first game. We're also doing sequels to that. So it's not like we publish a game and then, you know, we boot them out of our Slack channel and we don't email them again. We're still continuing to work with them. So generally, we, we like to have long-term relationships with people. The whole point of Raw Fury is to work with developers. And we would, the perfect ideal is if we, if we ship six games a year, Three of those are from new developers, and three for ones that we've already worked with in the past. Right? I don't know what that data is going to look like because we're we're only three years old. But ask me again in you know two three years, and we'll see what the answer is then. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, and uh, my question is, what do you think? What is the best um, uh, how's the stage of uh, development that I need to? go to uh, the uh, uh, for your company for I example. hate this question so it's, it can be uh, for example uh, can be for example uh, uh, blackout uh, with uh, most of the gameplay uh, so uh, okay so so the question is at what stage should you show your game to a publisher okay or best <laughs> right the that isn't up to me the publisher that is up to you, the developer. And we'll go back to the magic. If you cannot see something in your game that you are like, think is special, it's too early, OK? This game in the bottom right, their gameplay was awful. They downloaded a, uh, a standard Unity controller. It was third-person camera. Uh, it ran at like 22 frames a second. Um, that wasn't good. What was good was the incredible art style, was the people themselves, and their vision for what they wanted to build. So they had something special there. Um, Atomic Cops on the bottom left. This is only two months after we signed the game. A month before that, it looked completely different. So I don't care at what point I look at the game, as long as there's something there that grabs me as a publisher. The only answer I would give is do not approach me with your game if you've already launched into early access. because. The, all the value of a publisher is then gone, okay? Because it's too late, you've already launched. And also, our deals are built around the fact that we work long-term with developers from the prototype stage all the way up to shipping. Um, so it doesn't really make sense for a developer who's worked for three, four years on a game to approach us to, you know, two months before launch. That's the only thing I would say. But as far as when the prototype is ready, it's up to you as the developer. I'm happy to look at Blockout. As long as the gameplay is fucking amazing. I'm happy to look at something that has crappy gameplay if it looks amazing, right? There has to be something there. So uh, it's um, only my decision uh, when I think uh, the gameplay is the most uh, important thing in the project or it's uh, art style or something like this, right? What do I think is most important? No, no, no. It's up to you, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah that, there should be just something. Okay, thanks. No problem. The tiny build looking for a question. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you call him out specifically. <laughs> this was supposed to be a secretive question without the hat, but um, can you talk about you the... You took the hat off. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> nice. you wouldn't recognize me. Did it work? It, yeah, it did work. It did work. Yeah, yeah. but he, he uh, told right. so, me, so can you talk a little bit about your porting process and yeah. the costs involved? Where yeah. do you guys do it? How do you guys, like, uh, do you fully take the code or do you work with original devs? Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, how do we do the porting with developers? The... Long-term plan is probably to bring people in-house who can help with the porting. Right now, we, we do it externally. The way we do it is we work with a single company that is not actually a porting company. So we don't work right now with QLock or Blitworks or anyone like that. We work with a partner of ours called Coatsync. Um, holy shit. 
don't do that again. Uh, so we, we get the source code and we work very closely with a third party who are under retainer from us. Uh, we know what the costs are going to be. And it's almost like they're in-house, but they're, they're based. And actually, they live around the corner from me. I work remotely. So we, we do it that way. Um, if the developer wants to port the game themselves, then that's OK. But it really helps if they've shipped things on PS4 or things before. right? A lot of devs come to you and they want to do the porting themselves because they want to learn, how do I, how do I build for Switch? How do I build for PS4? What is this like? And actually, that's often a good idea for them to learn this stuff. But it can have an effect on the project if we think it's going to take a long time. Uh, so we work with a third party. If the dev, dev wants to do it, we let the dev do it. Uh, but we really, it's, it's, it's often up to the developer how they want it to do. Does that answer your question? Uh, also the costs? Well. The costs? Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be the, the same as you, right? It's different per project. It's different on the complexity of what the project is. And it's, it's different in terms of how long it, how long it takes. I don't have a, like, a straight answer for cost. Uh, but because we work with someone who we almost view as in-house, the costs are lower than, for example, just farming it out to a, a specific porting house or something like that. And they're, they're a company that we trust. So uh, the cost is, is not high, but it's, it's consistent, which enables us to, to talk about that at the beginning of a project. Did you get told off? Okay. <laughs> I, I would like to ask a little bit like a personal question. Okay. Because your no sounds very definitive. My what, sorry? No. Like no? it sounds really okay. definitive. It feels like you uh, really not like enjoy saying no, but uh, you say a no and that's it, you know, it's a cut off. Have it happened to you, uh, you say a no and then maybe you read something or see something outside which you know brings you back to an experience of a game you said no yesterday would you find strength to write another email and say, Yeah, all hey the guys. time. Of course. Absolutely. And a no from me might be definitive, but the, there's a reason for that. Um, before I worked at Raw Fury, I worked at Oculus, the VR company. Before Oculus, I worked at Intel. And I've been doing this for eight years, maybe. The reason I try and make a no definitive is because what you don't want to do is get a developer into a feedback loop. If I say, no, it was, it was pretty good, but this level is just, it, I didn't like it. What they're going to do is go home, work on the level, change it, bring it back. And I'm like, oh, you know, that was better, but the audio is not that great. They're going to go home, fix the audio, bring it back. This isn't what I'm trying to do, okay? So I've, I've found over the years of doing this type of thing where I'm saying no to people, to, to make it a no that they can just accept and understand. But if they come back with something different, I will always play it again, like I answered earlier. Um, and I've definitely said no to things that I regret later. Um, and I, would, I have no shame. I will call up someone I've said no to an hour ago and said, actually, I, I just saw an interview on Rock, Paper, Shotgun, and I'm an idiot. I'd like to say yes. I, I will, of course, do that. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> could there be a situation when uh, you're telling yes to a developer uh, and really eager to uh, publish a game, uh, and then you change your mind, something happened? Yeah, that's this, that's this process. Each one of these things requires a yes from us and the developer themselves, okay? So if, we, if I say yes at build and budget, that's not saying I'm going to publish your game. That's going to say, okay, I'm going to move you to the next point of the process, right? This seems like it's a very regimented thing. It's not, it's just this is how we tend to look at games. But each of, like if we, if the whole team plays, they don't like it, we don't sign the game. If we meet face to face and we hate each other, we don't sign the game. If, if you know, the, the scope or the finances don't make sense at all, we don't sign the game. So it's, I, I don't think I've ever heard of a publisher saying yes in like a pitch meeting and that being like, here's a contract, right? I, I just, I don't know if that's happened. Maybe it has. But for us, because we only sign a few games, we're not looking for many, many, many games, uh, we can say no at any point of this. And so can the developer. Okay, thank you. Has that happened so far? Yeah, quite a few times actually. Usually on the wider play sessions, you know, maybe I take 5% to build and budget and show them to the rest of the team. Maybe that now drops. 95% of those games maybe drop. And so it's, it's like a filter that comes down to a single game at the end. And if you looked at the chart, we signed six games. I look at maybe 800 a year. You can see how the, how the filter works. That reminds me of my first attempt to talk to a woman. <laughs> if you say yes, it doesn't mean anything. 
Uh, hi once again. Hello. So, um, as I understood, uh, if you like the game yeah. and you're ready to to give money to the dev, yes. So you pay him like salary. Yeah. For the whole dev process period, and what happens after you publish the game? So, do you stop? Uh, to pay that salaries, or will they receive only some uh, ref share? Or we have a uh, so, or, or first you you need to uh, get your money back, yeah, and okay. only after you'll pay the share. Yeah, so both. Uh, we have a buffer. Um, usually, it's around three months. Where okay, we say whenever. Let's say the game ships April two thousand nineteen. Okay, that's when we think it'll ship. In the contract, we have. July is when we'll stop paying you. So three month buffer. Let's say the game actually ships in July. We'll just shift that buffer out. So you have three months of getting paid. Uh, we do recoup first. Okay. So we do take our money first. Uh, and I, I want to talk about some maths real quick. And I'm terrible at maths. So hopefully this makes sense. And if you're bored, you please leave. I, I won't. I won't be sad. So the rate at which you re I thought you were leaving there. That was great. So the, <laughs> the rate at which a publisher recoups is really, really important. And I think one of the most misunderstood things about working with a publisher. Okay, I'll try and explain. So if I've spent a hundred thousand dollars on your game, that is, you know, your salary. That's some marketing. Maybe we showed it at PAX. Whatever it is, a hundred thousand dollars, and I recoup first before you start earning money and the rev share after that is 60 to you and 40 to us okay so fairly standard deal hundred thousand dollars the game cost to make that we paid we recoup that money first it's 60 40 60 percent of the revenue to you 40 to us there's two ways that a publisher does this the old school way and when you talk to developers from the 80s and 90s and maybe even early 2000s where they say a game made eight, nine, ten million dollars in profit, but we as the developer earned thirty dollars on the game. Okay, how does that happen? It happens at the rate of recoup. Okay? So if the game launches on day one, you owe me a hundred thousand dollars because that's what I've paid as a publisher to get the game to that point. The old way of doing it is to say, okay, $100,000, $60,000, that goes in your bucket, okay? $40,000, that goes in our bucket. Because we have a rev share, this is how it works, okay? So I put my $40,000 in the bank, okay? $60,000, that goes off to pay your debt. So I'm like, okay, $60,000 also goes in my bank. You look at the rate just then, What's actually happened is I've made $40,000 on the game and you've only paid off 60% of your revenue, even though the game has made enough to pay it all off. Where this gets really bad is if it's a 50-50 split. Because what I can do is say, okay, we spent $100,000, the game has made $100,000, I'll take 50, that goes in my pocket, you've now paid off $50,000 of debt. I might go, okay, I'm going to spend $50,000 on marketing this month. Okay? And if the contract allows me to do that, I'll spend $50,000 in marketing. The game has to make another $100,000 before that's paid off. So the publisher can keep the developer in debt forever, right? I tweeted about this the other day, and the developer said that their publisher bought a helicopter as soon as the game started to make profit to just bring it back down so where they never earn. So what we do in Recoup is it's 100% of the revenue goes off to pay your debt, until it's paid off, then we split to the rev share. So as a developer, I honestly think this is one of the most important pieces of, of working with the publisher is understanding not what the rev share is, but what the rate of recoup is. Because if you get a rate of recoup that the publisher is making profit whilst, whilst you're trying to pay off your debt, you might never make money at all. So just be really careful there. But yes, we do recoup first, but we try and get it done as fast as possible. What this usually means, because we don't charge for our own time, you know, we have a marketing person, we have me, we have PR, we don't charge for anything of that. The only things we add to the debt are actual spend, okay? So if we, if we pay for an advert, that charge that it costs for the advert is what will get added to the debt. We don't include the salary of the person who did that. Um, it means that often the dev is in, is in the black before we are, because we, we, we take back our money, and then we also have to earn back all the time and effort it took to get that. But the dev has already had his salary paid, and now he's making profit. Uh, so it is kind of confusing, and I'm sorry if that doesn't make sense. You can email me if you want more info. But 
I think it's really important to understand the rate of recoup almost as much as it is a rev share. And what happens if you cannot recoup, for example, if you spend uh, like hundred dollars mm -hmm. yeah, uh, to pay the salary to the dev, yeah. and then you launch the game and yeah. earn only like one dollar? That's life, you know? <laughs> so Actually, you're ready to accept this risk? The, the developer makes nothing, okay, in, in, on the contract, okay? Have it ever happened? Yeah. Really? Kathy Rain took a year to break even, okay? It took a year before the developer started making money. The decision we made as a nice publisher was to just pay, continue paying him anyway, because we knew that uh, we wanted him to survive and work on his next game. So, again, it brings me to the point of a contract is a contract. It's, it's important to have a good contract. It's also important to really trust the person you're working with, because it's up to them, really, if your game doesn't sell, what happens? And I think that's the most important part to look at a publisher. You can look at their big successes. Great, you know, that's perfect. What happens when a game didn't sell? What did the publisher do and how did they work it out? Thanks. Sure. And the last question. Uh, Hello. The question is, uh, how do your own preferences, like you know, favorite genres, settings, or maybe music, uh, influence the process of decision making? Do you have to deal with some inner demons while you? Do I have to deal with what? Sorry. Inner demons, you know, like. Can you ask the question again? Yeah. I, I don't quite uh, understand. How do your own preferences, yeah, like mm -hmm. game preference, like yeah. <clears throat> genre, setting, uh, okay. music, visual style, influence the process of decision making? Okay. So. Do I only sign games that I like, is I think the question you're asking, uh, or at least part of it. Uh, yeah. I, I would love to say that I am completely neutral for every genre. I have a full understanding of a Battle Royale, a battle royale game versus a simulator game versus a, uh, a roguelike game. Uh, it's not true, the, but this is my job. I, ha I have to look past what I personally enjoy playing and try to look at things neutrally, but like I said, Often that isn't the case, you know? Often it often depends on the person who's trying your game, and that sucks as a developer, but that's, that's just life. But I have absolutely signed games that I, I don't really want to play myself, but I understand that there's a market. Um, that said, Raw Fury as a company, we only sign games that people in the team in general are into, because you don't want to work for two years on a game that no one wants to play or enjoys, because you, what's the point in that? That's boring, right? It might make money, but, so what, you know, if we wanted to make money, we probably wouldn't be doing small indie premium games, okay? We want to make a certain amount of money, and we want to do things that we love. If we wanted to make a lot of money, we'd go and, we'd go and you know, I don't know, you tell me how to make a lot of money, but uh, it's probably not doing this. Um, so yeah, my personal preferences do come into play, but I try as hard as I can not to let them. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Is that it? Thank you very much, Callum. Oh, we have one more. Let's let him ask it. Люди uh, хотят throw me out. Люди гулять уже хотят. Хватит. So my question is, um, you already told that the VR is not what you like to um, to publish, but yes. uh, if we will send you a build, so do you have a device so to check it out? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. I really enjoyed Thank that. Thank you. Thank you.